as we all know, there has been flood myths uh, throughout history from all the different cultures in the world. And the Chinese civilization is no different. We have our own flood myth as well. And in today's video, we are going to talk about the Chinese flood myth, how the Chinese people deal with the issue, and the man who basically gave birth to the first, the first uh, dynasty in Chinese history. Hello and welcome to the series finale of Myths of China. My name is Apingo and I am the chain smoking writer. Here we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. Now if you would like to join us on this journey through time, I would highly suggest that you subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon so you'll be notified whenever a new video drops. Now in the later year of Sun's reign, um, the great floods hit the realm and vast stretches of land were washed away by the raging waters and great numbers of people uh, perished either from drowning or from the resulting famine and diseases. In the face of this catastrophe, Shun appointed a man named Kun to be the overall in charge to control the floods and bring stability back to the land. With such a heavy responsibility weighing on his shoulders, Kun led his followers and they all worked tirelessly to try and block, uh, block up all the possible passages that the flood waters could rush in and destroy everything in his path. Now for years, they toiled day after day, night after night, you know, going without rest. And they finally achieved a satisfactory result. You know, the land slowly dried out and the waters were blocked uh, outside of the realm. And the people kind of got back a semblance of the life they had before. However, this was not to last. Uh, as we mentioned, the method that these people used to control the floods was to actually build dikes and dams to block the water out of the realm. Uh, so over time, the pressure of the flood waters built up considerably behind the dikes and the dams that Kun and his followers built. And one day, it, the pressure got so huge that it finally broke through. What happened was that a small leak in an insignificant corner of a dike uh, quickly spread to cause the structural failure of the entire engineering endeavor that kept the waters out. So in a blink of an eye, nine years of efforts uh, were washed away in a single stroke. Now the flood waters came back stronger and fiercer than before and as if to make up for the time that was lost behind Kun's uh, dikes and dams, a massive destruction of the light that has never been seen before swept through the land and entire populations were decimated or wiped off from the face of the earth like they never existed before. Now hearing the news that the dams and the dikes have failed and um, massive destruction was going on in his realm, Shun was naturally furious at the failure of Kun and his followers. So he ordered Kun to be exiled to this place called Yushan or Yu Mountain, where he was uh, kind of imprisoned for three years and after three years he was executed. And legend had it that Kun held so much regret and frustration in his heart that his body refused to decompose for three years after his execution. So after Kun's execution, his son Yu was appointed to finish the job that his father failed so disastrously at. And um, in the beginning, Yu used the same strategies and the same methods as his late father, uh, namely trying to block the waters outside of the realm. But every single dam and dike or whatever method they use to block the waters, everything that they built uh, would fail over time. And the water would keep rising higher and higher to come over the highest dams and dikes that they could build. And soon you realized that you know it was futile to act directly against the forces of nature. And they needed to think out of the box and to come up with another solution to solve this uh, great problem that the people were facing at the time. So what happened was that he called a meeting with all the uh, elders with experience with uh, flood control and he you know, assembled all his late father's colleagues. 
and they spend days, you know, reviewing their past experiences and you know why they failed and working through all the possible solutions uh, that they could apply to this uh, dire situation. And you know, after days and nights of meetings and discussion, they finally came to a conclusion. You know, since it was futile to work against the forces of nature, uh, wouldn't it be wiser to work together with nature? Uh, instead of fighting the waters, would it be easier or would it be more advisable to actually guide the flow of the waters? So the idea was that, you know, uh, as water will always flow from a higher elevation to lower ground, uh, all they had to do was to find out the relative elevations of the land throughout the realm and then dig canals and ditches to redirect the waters into the eastern sea. So now that they have an overall strategy on how to deal with this problem, uh, Yu gathered all his followers and workers and taught them how to measure the land and how to clear congested waterways and how to find good locations for new canals and you know how to route them around these uh, obstacles in the way and after being satisfied that they were adequately trained uh, he sent these people out in teams to do land surveys to survey the land to find you know, good spots to dig their canals to guide the flood waters. Yu Yu personally would uh, lead a team to focus on the worst heat areas. Now, it was said that you would go around wearing nothing more than a you know straw hat and rough hand clothing, and he always had this uh, iron measuring staff on hand, you know, so he could measure the uh, elevation of the land and, of course, also the depth of the water that he was dealing with. And he worked together with his followers and his uh, workers, you know, hauling rocks, digging ditches, all the you know, heavy stuff. He did not shy away from getting his hands dirty and he worked together with everyone. And through the years, you know, under searing sun, through, through you know, bone chilling coal, uh, they toiled and they never stopped. It was said that he had his legs and feet soaked in water for so long that, you know, his toenails actually fell off. Ah, just the thought of it. Uh, yeah, his toenails fell off because they were soaked in water for so long. And the hairs on his legs uh, wore away, you know, from, you know, all the water. Yeah. Well, but uh, in the many years he traveled across the realm to you know control the floods, it was said that he went past his, his own home three times and he did not even once enter his main door to visit the wife that he left behind just four days after their marriage. Now Yu's wife was a lady named Tu Shan and she pleaded with him for years you know, before you actually agreed for her to join the flood control party. So she contributed by, you know, doing all the cooking and the delivery of food stuff and, you know, uh, materials for the frontline workers as they fought the waters. Now, it was a very great misfortune that during one of her delivery runs to bring food to the frontline, um, the heavily pregnant Tu Shan actually met with an accident and died along the way. Having heard the news, of course, Yu was devastated and he rushed to her body and pleaded with the heavens, you know, to, if they have to take Tu Shan from him, at least, at the very least, save the unborn child. It was as if the heavens really heard Yu's uh, pleas for mercy for his unborn child. Uh, you know, a miracle happened and a baby boy was delivered from the lifeless body of Tu Shan. And in honor of this miraculous birth, uh, Yu named his son Qi. So over the years, Yu's efforts and, his, and the stories of his sacrifices you know, spread among the populace. And they viewed him as a hero that is uh, you know, basically the savior of the people. You know, the widower with a baby child in his arms, fighting with all he had to save his people from the wrath of nature. Now, everywhere he went on his mission, you know, the people poured into the streets to welcome him. And villagers near the work sites of his team would, you know, bring them food and open up their homes uh, for the workers if they needed rest. 
So through their relentless efforts over the years, the swamps and the marshes uh, slowly became dry land and river deltas became fertile farmland and the rivers obediently followed their new pathways into the eastern seas. Now it took Yu and his team a total of 13 years of backbreaking work and, and the loss of his wife, you know, but they finally corrected the mistakes that his uh, late father had made and they accomplished something that no one had been able to accomplish before. I'm sorry, my, the dog is coughing, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you have finally, you know, tamed the floods that plagued the realm since, you know, time immemorial. So when it came time for... <laughs> so when it came time for Shun to choose a successor to the throne, uh, he honoured the tradition and the precedent of abdication and he asked the people to suggest uh, a candidate for the job to take over his role of leader. And of course, Yu was a unanimous uh, choice of uh, everyone from the nobles to the peasants to the commoners. And another side effect of this um, collective effort to tame the floods was that, you know, this uh, unprecedented collective effort needed to overcome this uh, potential catastrophe uh, that lasted basically two to three generations, brought about a further breaking down of the barriers between tribes and clans, and it further accelerated the as assimilation and the consolidation of the people into a more unified uh, single identity. And by the time that he ascended to the throne, uh, he was less of a you know high chief of a confederation of tribes and clans, but he was, in fact, more of a true king of a unified people. And this was in the year 2070 BC. Now, although the true concept of a Chinese empire would not happen for another two millennia, uh, the ascendance of Yu to the throne and the later creation of the Xia dynasty uh, would officially signal the end of Age of Mythology and we now stand at the beginning of historical China. And thus, we come to the end of the series, Myths of China. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you who has been, you know, with, with me throughout this entire journey and um, I am really grateful for all your support and to the Patreons that has been supporting the channel. It is because of you that made this channel possible and um, it is because of you that I decided to start this crazy project to tell 6,000 years worth of story on YouTube and um, I am grateful, I am really grateful for all the support that you have shown the channel and if you would like to continue with us through this journey through time yeah, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and click on the bell icon and of course, if you would like to support the channel on Patreon or any other social media platforms, all the links are available in the description box. And if you have anything to say, you have any questions either regarding this video or Chinese histories and myths in general, um, leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. I do personally go through all of your comments and I do try to reply to all of the comments if it's possible. And so, yeah, I guess that's it for today and that's it for this series and I will see you very soon in the next video.